Let's see who's sponsoring tonight's Hazmat Guys Roundtable. Hazmat 101 Consultants. Hazmat 101 Consultants and their instructors can provide quality consulting and virtual or in-person hazardous materials training for your agency. Owner and lead instructor, Bob Cascignano, is also available for lecturing at your fire or hazmat conference and has, in fact, done many speaking engagements across the country. Visit their site at www.hazmatconsultants.com or email Bob Cascignano at bob at hazmat101consultants.com. For over 20 years, k &R plaques have had the pleasure of helping clients choose awards for the people they want to honor. Their state-of-the-art equipment allows clients to design, customize, and personalize the awards they choose for that special someone. With one of the largest selections of plaques, awards, trophies, and clothing apparel, they can deliver quality products to satisfy any customer needs. No order is too big or too small. Visit their website at www.knrplaques.com or email at sales at knrplaques.com. Responder Training. RTE is the leading company in delivering propane training along with emergency response equipment. Responder Training has many propane flaring kits, water injection kits, accessories, and replacement parts available. They also sell the only commercially available 1-inch propane flare kit, appropriately named the Dragon Slayer, because size does matter. Contact our good friend, owner instructor, Ron Huffman, for more information. You can reach him at 765-524-4848. You can email Ron at respondertraining.rdh.gmail.com or peruse his website at respondertraining.com. If you'd like to sponsor the show and help keep live hazmat conversations coming in the future and help send at least one lucky participant to a national level hazmat conference, send an email to bob at thehazmatguys.com and he'll send you the information. Thanks a lot. Now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Whoa, whoa, Jesus, I just dropped my phone. There you go. Welcome back to another Hazmat Guys Roundtable. Um, we are going live once again. Um, we are with the Kosh, the Jay-Z, minus the mic. But we have two beautiful guests with us. Um, welcome, guys. How are you guys? Good, sir. Awesome. Um, Bob, why don't you introduce our guest a little bit, please? We have Captain Jason Gore and Chief Patrick Grubbs from the Winston-Salem, North Carolina Fire Department. And they're going to talk a little bit today about the quite a big incident they had just a few months ago. Um, so we got some firsthand knowledge of exactly what happened. And uh, and I think we've we've got an announcement at the end of the show, don't we? Excellent. Yes, we do. All right. Stay on for that. <laughs> so um, while we set up the story once again, just so everybody that wasn't here last week kind of gets where we're going what, what was happening here jason you want to start with the uh yes around six o'clock on what was the date again patrick uh january 31st january 31st got dispatched to the weaver fertilizer plant on indiana avenue uh first arriving company got on scene had a large fire on the Alpha Bravo corner of the structure, correct? That's, That's right. Loading docks area of the uh, fertilizer plant. A little background about the plant. It was built in the 40s, if I'm not mistaken, and had been in operation ever since. Uh, it uh, was primarily a wooden structure and had a large storage of ammonium nitrate plus other fertilizer. Um, first arriving company initially made an attack and kind of escalated quickly from there, <laughs> I would say. Um, Patrick, you can kind of pick up because you were there a lot earlier in the incident than I was. Yes, yeah, so I, I arrived with the uh, original arriving crew. They pulled in and in front of me. Uh, we had a lot of fire on the Alpha Bravo. We used Alpha Bravo Charlie instead of ABCD. Um, and 
pretty much we knew it was going to be a defensive attack from the start. Uh, our initial game plan, our strategy was to cut the fire off. Uh, the building's very large. It's probably four or 500 foot long. I don't remember exactly. Uh, but we had probably, let's say, probably about 50 foot of it was involved already. So the initial idea was, all right, we're going to go in between the burned and the unburned, and we'll stop it there. Um, we knew a lot of the hazards going in, but we're like, all right, we got to do what we can, see if we can get a stop on this thing. And so before we could even really get our ladder trucks positioned, and they, they arrived quickly as well. It wasn't like there was any kind of delay. Uh, before they could even arrive, the building had, um, I mean, the fire had spread pretty much to the far other end of the building. Um, I don't know if you've heard any of the radio traffic, but um, before our uh, arriving companies could even do a full walk around of the building, they started reporting heavy smoke and fire on the far other end. So we knew at that point, we're not, we're probably not stopping this thing. And as the Captain Gore already said, uh, it was built of heavy timber, had a lot of steel in the, in the roof of it, but the majority of it was heavy timber. And being from the age of it, it was all dry. And the amount of chemicals that have been in the building for all those years, they've just saturated into that wood. So although it was heavy timber, it was still, it was kind of a kindling, it was heavy, heavy kindling in a way. Uh, so like I said, the, the fire was well ahead of us. Um, some of the, what we did discover later on is the fire had probably been burning for 10 to 15 minutes before the first call ever came in, looking at some security cameras and some stuff like that. Uh, so the fire had 15 minutes head start on us. Um, that's pretty much did, where we were at when we got there. Go ahead. Did you, did you guys see in that initial size up, like, was there anything that was making you go, wait a second, like you were saying that the, the, the chemicals seeped into the wood, which I've seen a couple of times, and every time that kind of stuff happens, somebody at the scene goes, something like was um, making my, my spidey senses tingle. Like, like I was like, this isn't normal. And I'm not saying something like crazy, like green smoke or purple smoke or really weird things. Was there anything that was kind of like, besides the title of the place, that was kind of being like, that's odd. In the initial arrival, no, there was nothing. Um, the wind was at our, I'll say, coming from the Alpha to the Charlie side, and that's the side we were on. So it's pushing back. All the smoke was going um, away from us, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. But I'll go, I can go into it further. But that created some other issues that we weren't. That kind of put us behind the put us behind the ball game. So um, I did hear some reports later on from some of the other company officers. You know, that, mm -hmm. um, they didn't necessarily communicate in the beginning, but they were like, hey, this smoke is different. Something's weird about this smoke. Um, you know, we've all been around smoke, we've all smelled it, but then it's kind of like something, something's different with this one. And we knew, you know, we, were, we had our backs against the wall from the start once we pulled up and, and saw what we had and knew the building. So we knew that it was, it was gonna be a, a, a big event. We just didn't know how big. Wow. Was, was there a lot of pre-planning done on that building? prior throughout the years there was um and <clears throat> pre-plans you know we had them and, and getting to them and that that's some of the stuff that i guess I, i've tried to communicate since this all happened is the pre-plans are really good until i need them right now um, <laughs> yes and you know when you're i need it right now and so we typically we send um eight comp, eight heavy pieces of equipment to uh a structure fire so that's five engines two ladders and a rescue so typically with eight people with eight companies that's a lot to manage with one incident commander in itself on this one we went ahead straight second alarm pretty quickly after that we got a third alarm so my span of control was way out of out of proportion from the very beginning. Um, we were somewhat short-staffed in, in our command structure because you can only be, get there so fast. You know, we're, the um, battalion chiefs are spread across the city and they can only get there so fast and, and do so much. You, they can't teleport there. So trying to get all that infrastructure and, and on my side up to speed, um, it felt like forever. It actually happened pretty quickly, but um, 
Yes, there, back to the question was, were there pre-fires? Yes, there were. Um, we did have one person that was on site who was giving us information. Um, so we're using the information he gave us and trying to get somebody to, you know, I'm, I'm running three radios and trying to look on a computer for a pre-fire. It doesn't, those, that math just doesn't add up. Right, now, Chief, Chief, do you guys have anything like e-plan? Or anything like that? Yeah, we yes. have that. Go ahead, Igor. Uh, so, we, yeah, so we, uh, the HAZBAT team members have access to it. And uh, that evening, I did pull up the E plan and send it to some of the incident commanders on the scene um, uh, Chief over HAZMAT and a few others. They had their hands full. So I made some communications to some other officers that were out there. And HAZMAT was dispatched pretty early on. So they had access to E-Plan and the Tier 2 reports. Uh, the last one was done in 2019, as I recall. <clears throat> Sometimes it's uh, having that RP, a responsible party there, is even actually better, if you can hold on to them, better than having the, the pre-plan because it's the, obviously the most up-to-date. But I guess sometimes you got to take uh, whatever they say with a grain of salt as well. Uh, to that point, um... I agree with you on both on everything you just said. Uh, so when a guy walks out of the building and tells me that this is what's going on inside, I typically you tend to believe them. Um, you know, we don't really know who they are necessarily. And I still don't know who that person is. He was talking to one of our captains. Um, but we asked one of our first questions is, where's the ammonium nitrate? How much? Those were our questions. Uh, we know there's a lot of other chemicals, but they weren't going to kill us right now. That was what we were worried about. Um, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of the building, but on the on the alpha side is where we were at. There is a, another building um, that's detached. It's up to code. It was up to code. It was a, a modern structure. Uh, he told us that all the ammonium nitrate was in the small building, which when they told me that in command, I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. We put all the dangerous stuff in the new building that's up to code, and, you know, um, and I was, I would say up the code. The other building was up to the code that it was required to be up to. The building to, to the front was, um, I should just say more modern. Um, all the buildings were up to code that they were required to, but it was up to a newer code. Um, so our whole efforts kind of at that point switched into, all right, let's protect this building. Um, we're gonna do everything that we can to protect the major hazard here. Um, I got, a, I got a question, I, and I'd like to ask actually both of you, um, and I'll start with Captain Gore, if you if if you could. Um, would you consider this, this is like a chicken and the egg thing, would you consider this a hazmat that had a fire issue or a fire that had a hazmat issue? I think it was a fire that caused a hazmat issue. I think that uh -huh. initially it was a fire that bred into a hazmat issue. Um, I think early on, recognizing the fact that it had a hazmat involved into it definitely escalated the incident, um, which Chief Grubbs can interject more into this. Um, pretty much most people on the scene have been familiar with the building. We had had a couple incidents there in years past, and we were familiar with the, the stockpile of ammonium nitrate. Um, as he said, when it was an interesting evening, there were things that kind of played in our favor. Um, I came from the South. And like he said, other companies didn't, uh, it, it got communicated so shortly before we evacuated, but um, there was a very strong phosphorus smell to the smoke. Um, and this was up to, what, two, three miles away, maybe. Um, so it, it had an ominous smell like a struck match. So <clears throat> putting those pieces together, it definitely changed the decision making pretty early on. Chief? I'm sorry, repeat that again? Just, I'm, I'm asking your perspective. Do you think this is more of a um, fire that had a hazmat issue or an, a hazmat that had a fire issue? Kind of a chicken or the egg kind of thing. What do you-, yeah, what do you I, tend to, I tend to agree with Captain Gore in the sense that this was a fire that had a, a major hazmat. Um, I think if the, if the hazmat had a cause to fire, I would go the other way, but I think for this one, it was more the um, the fire.
created the problem. Um, is Do you think at any one? point during the thing that like the hazmat outweighed the fire where you were seriously considering like, okay, maybe we need to kind of do that extra step that we can do in hazmat and say, we're not doing anything. We're just going to protect exposures. We're letting this thing run because it's not worth the uh, risk versus reward. So yes, very early on, like I was saying before, very early on, we were told that the ammonium nitrate was in the small building in the front, the small building to the front on the alpha side. So we were doing everything we could to protect it. And then we were kind of going back and forth on, are we going to be able to actually protect this building or not? Um, there, we got one report that there was some kind of flaming liquid running down the, uh, running out of the building. And they were trying to put that out because it was running right into the small building. And then in the meantime, we're still trying to do our 360 of the building. Uh, like I said, the wind was blowing 15 mile an hour or something like that, maybe toward the Charlie side. So all the smoke was laying down, pushing toward the back. And our crews, when they, when they went around, engine nine, uh, engineer Johnson, he went around and he couldn't get around the back because the, the fire was probably 30, 40 foot flames and it was pushing to the back side. So he couldn't actually physically walk around there because he was he couldn't see where he was going. It was that much smoke on the ground. So he kind of regrouped. They found another way in and um, they could get further back away from the building. And then they looked and they said, wow, they said, there's rail cars back here. What's in these rail cars? And, and they couldn't tell what they were from where they're at because they, all I can see is kind of the shadows of them through the smoke. And so we get back to our person again that's on site. We ask him, so what, what's in these rail cars? And he said, salt. And we said, okay, that's not a big deal. That's what we were told. So Shortly, a little bit later after that, we were kind of getting a grip of everything. We're starting to kind of pull everything back. Um, and someone from the railroad arrived about the same time that a, another representative from the company arrived. And uh, our other chiefs were getting their operations chief and our deputy, our um, assistant chief of operations and our fire chief were actually getting there at that time. And uh, so they started talking to them and, and that's when we found out that there was 600 tons of ammonium nitrate in the building that was on fire and 90 tons in the rail car. Um, wow. So that, when we found that out, then it was a major change of strategy. It was, uh, that's when we decided, all right, we're packing up and leaving. Uh, and that's when we went to the full, like decommit, get out of here, the um, drop everything and run. Mm. Because we realized we we had already probably been there too long, really. Um, <coughs> and the initial reports wow. from the rail car were that it was whistling. Um, I don't know. I wasn't there, but they said it was whistling. And the rail cars are approximately five foot from the building that was on fire. So oh, wow. we were looking for it to get around 450 degrees to have an explosion. <coughs> and uh, how it didn't get there, I don't know. Wow. So I had a question uh, concerning the rail cars right off the bat. Did the shape of the rail cars coincide with what they told you? Uh, you know, it, Jason, you're saying yes. Does it, was that does that look like it? They were hover cars. They were okay. Cars. So they, yeah, they. Uh, <clears throat> we later found out, as he said, that it was ammonium nitrate, um, very large amount of ammonium nitrate, and I do believe some of the original temperatures that they got was around 400 degrees. Is that correct? Jeez. Yes, we, and like I said, one of the cars did have salt in it. The, however, there were three cars there. I think one was empty, one had salt, and one had ammonium nitrate in it. And it was directly adjacent to the structure. It was actually burning just above it. So it was definitely getting some heat impingement on the side face of the structure. Yeah, that, that, that I can see happening, like, especially, and again, I'm not a rail guy. I, I know there's people uh, that are rail guys that are watching here, but like, I, I think that the hopper is not as much of a container, and I'm saying this very loosely, 
rather than like the 105, the 111, which is like a actual uh, low pressure, no pressure. Pressure's in the word. Is hopper is not really in the in the word. So if if that ammonium nitrate starts to decompose and create some some uh, vapors that would it, it would come out rather easily. The problem with the ammonium nitrate in that manner is confinement equals you know uh, explosions. And so uh, like yeah, the the five foot. If it was five hundred feet, I'm like all right, no, you know, but it's five feet. That is direct radiant heat impingement. Uh, I, I would be a little concerned. And you didn't have a locomotive nearby to push those things out, right? No, no. no they didn't. Uh, they were actually, they weren't on the main track. It was like a little offshoot track that goes over to the facility. And that's what they were sitting on. And they were kind of underneath the canopy. Um, I don't know if Bob can check his emails now or not, but um, I sent him a picture of it. Yeah, we actually have, uh, while you guys are talking, we got a couple of pictures and videos that are playing in the background. Okay. Um, showing uh, guys on hand lines um, in a defensive posture and uh, stuff around the rail cars itself. But let me wow. Go and check those as well. And interestingly enough, I was on the initial crew that went back three days after to put uh, lines on the ammonium nitrate. And uh, it was still heated up at 400 plus three days later. And they made a decision to go ahead and hack then because it was, it had been sitting there cooking for a couple of days. The hazmat team went on top of the gondola. The top of the gondola was made of fiberglass. Uh, when they opened the hatch, there was a pressure roll. It actually did vent fairly extensively from what I understand even with the fiber last lid. So it had built up some pressure in the rail car. Um, and that was three days later, it still had that much. It had a couple pounds of pressure on it still. So. Wow. That is, there's a lot of potential there. And for, and for those of you guys that are listening or involved, I mean, like you're talking about ammonium nitrate plus a fuel oil, like the Timothy McVeigh in 95, uh, at the Morrow building in Oklahoma City, or most recently, and I'm going to say this is maybe a year ago, uh, is Beirut, Lebanon. You know, that was, I believe, if memory serves, like 2,800 tons of ammonium nitrate. They said that was in the order of, of a small nuclear device um, uh, of detonation, which is in, insane. There's videos out on that thing, and I highly recommend everybody to kind of check that out. I don't think you guys got to that point. But like, what I'm thinking in my head is, and again, I'm not armchair quarterbacking at all. Is that during a fire, things get very dirty. The, the walls get sooty, everything gets dirty. And when you have a fire with ammonium nitrate, the contamination of the smoke in the ammonium nitrate, it would be like I, as time would march on, I'd be tweeting in the incident commander's ear, going. It's getting close. We, we're going to have to stop pulling back soon because that contamination means, you know, in order for a reaction to happen, an explosion, deflagration, whatever it might be, as contamination goes up, that threshold to meet that explosion or de uh, deflagration goes down. And so there's a point where it meets. You know, you have the ignition point. You have the air. You have the fuel you're just waiting for enough energy to get that chain reaction to going. And, and it, when it happens, it happens kind of quickly. So like, that's like, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to put it in my mind's eye of how this whole thing's working. And it's like, man, this is, this is a difficult one. You guys were dealt a extraordinarily hard card on this one. And you guys came out looking great. So nice job. Yeah. So I think one of the big things with like the Beirut was the um, age of the product. Yeah, definitely. And, um, it had been, it, it was right there on the on the coast. So it had a lot of water saturation in it and it had broken yep. down quite a bit. Um, from my understanding, everything that we were dealing with was basically brand new. I mean, it was in, in tip top shape. Uh, of course, the stuff in the rail car was brand new. And, and I think they were in the process of actually making fertilizer prepared for the spring time. So I think that was a, one thing in our favor that it was all very, fresh uh, product it hadn't been sitting for a long time to you know um disintegrate that's hey, good did you guys that's have like like drones from FLIR system or anything like that to kind of 
So we did. Once, once we um, moved to the other command posts, um, we uh, we had drone teams come in and we flew drones um, about every 20 minutes. And during that, I mean, there was only so much information we could get from them. Um, the amount of heat that was coming off of the place was kind of like, you couldn't even really do much to get close to it. We were just basically waiting for a, for a boom, really, at that point. Um, wow. wow. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's hey, crazy. Were you guys, like, with the firefighting stuff, I, I, I know the answer I would have. Uh, is were you guys concerned with runoff or anything like that? I know where I, I am not a thought would be given to it <laughs> yeah so we were but not really um not in the sense of not until days later um Good. okay so in the beginning we were like yes we're considering it but then it was like everything was spiraling out of control in a way so fast i'm, a, I'm not gonna say spiraling out of control but it was escalating in a, in a fashion that was like um we don't even have enough people to get what we need done much less um you know, we were also getting reports of the building behind it that it was on fire. So we're sending crews to that building trying to figure out, and it's a huge warehouse as well. Uh, we're being told that it's on fire, flames are coming out of it. So we're like, uh-oh, what, what we got going on there? Um, one thing too that I think, uh, since this is the, the hazmat guys, and something for, um, I guess, I, I, I'm understanding you guys are instructors, is to talk about is all the hazmat classes I've ever been in, we, you know, we pull out the ERG guides and we look at everything and like, oh, this chemical is real bad. This is a half mile evacuation. This one's a, a mile evacuation or whatever. Um, putting that into practicality is unbelievably challenging. Um, and also another thing that you don't consider that I never considered um, until that night was we pulled up, we started fighting fire. We've got four or five trucks full of water. Um, we've got hydrants connected. We've got people pumping hydrants. All of our trucks are in use, and so we pull. And so we pull the plug and say, "Okay, hey, we're we're out of here. Drop everything you got. Run over hoses. It doesn't matter. Like kind of. I don't want to say all rolls are off, but we're running. We're we're running at this point. And yeah. um, what well, what you don't think about is how are the people going to get a mile away? All their trucks are tied up. So you've got five six crews standing there. They've run to the end of the road. And they're like, now what do I do? Now what? <laughs> yeah. So that's just something to think about maybe on the hazmat side. You know, what's your plan? What? How are you actually going to get a mile away? Um, because a lot of times your trucks are tied up. And we have people in cop cars. We have people, you know, piled up in fire trucks. And, and um, a guy from one of the EMS is a... Uh, um, the chief over EMS, he rode with me in my Tahoe. And so we're just leaving equipment and stuff everywhere. So just that's something that I thought that, you know, I, I was unprepared for as to what to do when we actually do go to that evacuation. And then once we relocated, it was like, okay, how we're going to evacuate a mile radius. Um, that actually works out to 3.1 something square miles, which is, uh, a lot of streets and there's a lot of ways to get into it and especially in a in an urban area it ain't like you just pull your truck out there and say hey don't go down this way because you know what they're going to do they're going to go to the next street over cut down to the neighborhood and, just do it anyway. and they're going to go in um also with evacuations you can't completely close the road because you can't trap the people who are inside inside so you have to let them out which leaves an opening for other people to go in uh, it's, it was a challenge because you're way, also weighing how many people do I want to put there to, to be a, you know, if I park a fire truck there, they can drive around it. If I put a person there, they can stop the car. But also if I put a person there, they're in danger. They're, they're on the border of, of what we're considering an explosion zone. And do I want them to stand there and wait? And so that was a lot of weighing that went on over the course of that first night was trying to figure out, you know, how deep do we want to go in? And, and we ended up, ended up making the decision that we were going to try. We went to every street in that, in that entire three square miles um, with bullhorns or PA systems. Um, we were on all kinds of media. 
we even went to some apartments and and did everything that we could um and so that was pretty from a nerd from instant commander and I, and just thinking about this from the hazmat standpoint is how are you going to do those evacuations if you pulled your, your people out how are you going to get the other people out um so essentially we had to send people into the hot zone to to do what we could to, to make the evacuations so that's a tough decision to make you know from the um, instant command standpoint wow yeah i bet and, and this went on for a couple of days right because you guys ended up going back in several days later yeah so we went back in we never um we there was no one so when we did the evacuation order pretty early on we kind of made the decision like we're, we're not going to leave any um citizens behind and um we kind of felt that that was our obligation and our duty is, is what we kind of signed up for and that's what we do and so of course when you take three square miles and there's going to be handicapped people people without vehicles there's everything you can think of in that area and uh so we got with our transit authority and we got some little you know vans and buses um and all these things were a challenge because it, okay now it's you know closer to midnight and we've uh we called the transit authority and we're like hey send us three buses over here like right now and uh, okay so they you get three buses and three people who have no idea that anything's going on they show up and they go what do you want me to do and so you're like okay i don't need a whole <laughs> big bus actually i need like a little van because if i take a bus down this little neighborhood and get it stuck then we get you know so just stuff like that was all night was trying to figure you know fix these little problems and um somewhere shortly after we had got to the command post the sheriff's officer came up to me and said we've had a, um, the uh, water station exploded and i was like do what and she said yeah the, the water station exploded and i said i don't i don't like explain the explosion there's two there's different what kind of explosion are we talking about are we under attack that kind of thing yeah and uh, she said no the, the we're i guess we pulled so much water um or something happened in the system the actual backflow preventer blew out the roof of the building it just destroyed demolished this building blew the doors off the hinges the whole thing but i'm thinking at this point you know we've had a, another building explode within three miles from here what's going on but turned out it was just from the water pressure but it was another issue that popped up along the way that's like okay what next you know it was just a, a continuous yeah. on top of all this Kevin Gore, any uh, hazmat takeaways that you would have? You know, things that you like you were told in class, and you because everybody gets these class. Like, like she was just saying, like you know, the evacuation thing is like we heard about it in class, but then it was like, holy crap, it's happening right in front of us. Like anything that you would like, kind of throw out there is like, I completely forgot. Well, this was a great lesson learned. Well, I think that a lot of hazmat techs, you know, when we go through our training. We, we teach them to slow down and, and make some calculated decisions. And, and I think in certain incidents, action to take, <clears throat> but there are incidents like this where being a good hazmat tech and recognizing when a situation has gone from that fire to that hazmat and it's escalating quickly to make a quick calculated decision to give that information to the incident commander that this is no longer a, you know, just a fire, it's a hazmat. And that's, you know, we're, we're trying to stop, slow down a lot in hazmat, and, but there are many times where we have to say, stop, you know, this, this is escalating. You know, we have information that the average fire officer might not know and say, look, you know, this, this is involving nitrates. This is involving something that could explode and give that to, information to them quickly. So there are times that uh, in hazmat, we can't just sit back and act slowly. We have to give that information quickly. And this is one of them. This is one of them that, uh, you know, we recognize really early on that, uh, crap, we need, to, we need to make a decision quickly. And we've been there a while, but um, I, I can say that we uh, made a very good decision to get out of there when we did. Um, like I said, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of people who really don't know why it didn't go off. There's, there's a lot of guesses, but uh, I think that getting us out of that situation early on was definitely the right choice. Kudos, wow. guys. Very nice job. Yep. Excellent. Very nice. Uh, 
You guys are more than welcome to hang out for a couple more minutes because we are going to make an announcement. I'm going to let Bob Kosh take this one over. Um, we put on a special contest, and Bob's going to put it out. Yes, yeah, so we – let me get to the proper – we had a contest, if you will, and we put out a lot of – we had, a, what, dozens and dozens of people that submitted an essay. And one of the things that, that we were looking for is what does – hazmat mean to you like what what is your what does it mean to you what do you want to see what do you want to do and when we read all these there was a lot of them and we came across one that i don't know i it was it it, it had me not standing <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean i it, it had me <laughs> so what this what this was is it was the whole thing with the round table is we've tried to all the advertising is we've taken this money in so that we can sponsor somebody to go to a conference like Baltimore. And that's what this is about. And I think proud to announce that the winner is Joseph M. Hordash, Battalion Chief from, I'm gonna mess this up, Algany County Hazmat Red Team 440 um, in Pennsylvania. So Joseph, congratulations. And we will be in touch with you within the next day or two to Kind of finalize everything and tell you what you got to do and and whatever but um you you're know, hanging what, with us you're hanging with us and we might even buy you a drink oh whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. that's the other way around right? oh yeah. wait that's right that's, <laughs> i got i had it backwards he's got to buy us a drink i forgot about that um Whew. but we're going to keep doing that so if you want to sponsor the show please let us know because we want to keep sending people to conferences that wouldn't otherwise get the opportunity. Um, it's about sharing the information, sharing the knowledge, and um, you know the hazmat community is a tight community, and whatever we can do to help out, you know, we've as as I was coming up is hey, pass it along as you get it. So, I on the way out, I'm going to tease one thing. I heard just today that there's going to be another major national conference that is lining up, and the guy a guy called me. And said, what do you think? And I said, that sounds awesome. And oh. I, I've heard of some pretty cool ideas. This one is pretty cool. So with that being said, I'm going to tease that and leave that on the mic drop. Here we go. Stay um, tuned. Thank you, everybody, for coming on to this month's uh, Hazmat Roundtable. Uh, we'll see you guys next month. Thank you.